Hey, you, hey, you, come on, sit down. You're sitting at the grown ups table. I'm your host, Jesse Pimpinella. And right now, John, he's on sabbatical. Uh, actually, he's doing the, the awesome fatherly thing. Right now, he's with his daughter uh, for his birthday. So shout out to Lucy. Happy birthday to you. And uh, we just want to say we got a great show uh, for you today. Um, so we're going to talk about some serial killers since it's the Halloween season. And that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, real quick before we start, like and subscribe, share this link, let other people be watching it, and make sure you light up the comment section like we know how, you know how to. So, serial killers, why are they fascinating? Why do we watch? Netflix has put in an enormous amount of documentaries on, on their true crimes, everything. We are obsessed with it, especially after lockdown. So, the only way I can really get to the bottom of this is to bring on what I call two serial killing experts. Not to say that they're murderers, but man, can they kill on a stage. Uh, please help me welcome Mr. Dan Brady and Dr. Johnny Smith. Hey, folks. What's up? Hey, hey everybody. Thanks for having me. Yeah, now, thanks for having us on, Jesse. It's not a problem at all. I'm very excited to have both of you. Uh, for those who do not know these two, these two are the hosts of Murderous State of Mind. Can you give the audience a little bit of a taste of what is the murderous state of mind well it's a dark humor podcast that is centered around american serial killers uh basically it's two best friends just uh, are you literally doing dip on my show right now yes i am <laughs> i have a classy broad <laughs> all right i want somebody to start chewing how bubble dare gum. you use tobacco products <laughs> <laughs> I just like hey, you remind me of that gym teacher that always sneak dip when he's teaching classes. <laughs> he's like, "All right, kids, yes, you up." <laughs> I think I think this is the best representation of our podcast right now. This is us. It's uh, <laughs> two best friends having a conversation about American serial killers every week. Every week, that's awesome. And 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 like I said, I, I pose this question to the audience. Why do you think serial killers are so fascinating? Why is this such a hot topic right now? I just think uh, evil fascinates people. Well, everybody loves uh, everybody loves horror, um, and mm -hmm. the real horror isn't monsters in a book or on a on a movie screen. Especially humans that walk among us, live among us. Um, the fascinating part about serial killers is they are everybody. Um, they're your next door neighbor. They're your cousin. They're your brother in law. That is very fascinating, and and I think a, what's very interesting about, uh, especially because I'm I'm a huge nor a horror geek, all right. And uh, one of the things that was very interesting is that after 9/11, horror movies took this huge shift because before that, slashers, monsters, aliens, animals, creatures. But as soon as 9/11 happened, we started reflecting upon what can humans do. That is so evil and so dangerous. That's why you got Saw coming out like crazy. Hostile coming out like crazy. All these movies that revolve around what human beings will do to each other and hurt each other and kill each other. And, and, and it, it's it's definitely a reflection of what you just said. You know, The whole idea of fearing what could be your neighbor, your brother, your father could be the next Meryl, you know, uh, not Meryl Manson. I want to be the <laughs> Charles Manson. <laughs> why were you like, like, why is he singing over there and punching out his wife? No, <laughs> Charles Manson, not Meryl. Okay. Well, as as humans, I think instinctively we enjoy the feeling of fear without the real risk. Um, yes. That's why people love roller coasters. That's why people listen mm -hmm. to horror uh, stories or true tales of uh, something completely terrifying. A lot of these guys were nares. Um, and can get fear without having the actual danger. Yeah. And for me, too, it's just the psychological um, the factor of it, like how just a couple events in someone's life can lead to them, you know, removing a woman's nipple with uh, electrical uh, wire yeah. cutters. You know, it's that whole process that a human mind can go on to get you to that fascinates me. Yeah, it, it and it, and like I said, it it, it kind of I, I always love that because that idea that you're talking about was one of the things they based the Joker on the one bad day theory. What what will break somebody's mentality? You know, just 
turn them that way. You know what I mean? And I think that's why we do a lot of serial killing docs because we want to figure out what was it, what was the catalyst, I, what what I, is I, it. I, I think it's a mistake. I think it's a mistake to think though that it's one bad thing that causes oh, serial killer. Yeah. When a lot yeah. of these guys <laughs> have a it's have a pattern and history of abuse and the people that love them failing them right. before the outside world had a chance to hurt them. Best case in point of this is the uh, killer we just recently covered, Donald Harvey. Like, he grew up in an abusive household. Uh, Johnny's favorite term we got from that book, good rug sea fights. Uh, his mom said uh, his <laughs> father would hit me and I'd see the rug and then I'd hit him and he'd see the rug. Good rug sea <laughs> fights. And then he had... Two sexual relationships that started when he was four and five, and just uh, this whole, you know, everything. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, John. Uh, everything that just kind of leads up to that, and then one day, like just uh, a patient flung poop at him, and his just immediate reaction was to smother him with a pillow. Jeez, like a lot of stuff built up to that, and then he just kind of broke, and you know, then he killed uh, fifty-five people. Uh, in three different hospitals. Oh, geez. That, confirmed. That is, 55 confirmed. Burnt. Rumored to be higher. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah that's like how, like, H.H. H. Holmes, you know, when he, he had the death hotel. Like, nobody knows the number. And but then we, you, with these stories, sorry to cut you off, but with these stories, you don't get a lot of karma. But Donald Harvey was actually beaten to death in his prison cell. So, you know, kind of a happy ending there. <laughs> uh, hey. Hello. This uh, is this is us. We are very, you know, uh, we don't like these guys, but we like telling the stories. So we're kind of weird uh, like that. Well, that's the type of uh, minds we went on the show today. So right. uh, without further ado, uh, why don't I let you two uh, give us the taste of the murderous state of mind. Form of a broken home. Johnny. They're pushing on its skin. With our powers combined. <laughs> we are laggy ass murderous states of mind. Hi, <laughs> 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 folks. I'm Dan Brady. Jesus Christ. And I am Dr. Johnny Smith in the building. <laughs> My God, this is terrible. Uh, today we have a seat at the grown ups table. What's up? That's right. And we're joined by our good friend, uh, Jesse Pimpinella. Uh, hey. Today, today we are taking a look at a fictional serial killer that appeared on in both the books and the movie Silence of the Lambs. Oh, hey. Uh, we are talking about Jane Gum, a.k.a. Buffalo Bill. We're going to be talking about the Buffalo Bill's background and murders. Plus, we're going to cover the killers that Thomas Harris, the author of Silence of the Lamb, Borrowed from to create Buffalo Bill. All oh, right, that's, that's uh, I was making sure I didn't cut off anybody. That that uh, that's absolutely fascinating. I'm really now, real quick. Let me at, pose this question to you both and to the audience: Silence of the Lamb, horror movie or not a horror movie? Horror movie, definitely, or at least the I think, psychological. I think it's a horror thriller. movie, but it's yeah, it's intelligent. Yeah, and that's one of the things. It was uh, the Oscars. I, I I talk about this all the time, as well as other history or movie historians talk about this. Anytime there's a movie that is a horror movie that gets any critical attention, they immediately try to wipe horror off of it, like it's a dirty term, and they call it thriller, uh, suspense. Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, look well, at Get Out there, was there. nominated for a comedy. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So anytime they uh, parasite, you know, they try to wipe horror movie off of that as fast as they could, and it won Best Picture. You know, um, so yeah, so no, definitely, I I agree. It's it's a horror movie down to its core. So without further ado, I don't want to interrupt anymore. And people, be ready to post your comments because this is going to get really interesting and juicy. Uh, let's let's dive in. Let's uh test that lag real quick before we get started, Johnny. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, Dan, can you hear me? I can hear you. That was a two-second response. Just give me something real quick back. Uh, I'm ready to do this episode, Johnny. How about you? Oh, boy. 
Yeah. <laughs> this is going to be an interesting episode. I'll just try to like chime in in between the, the two seconds. They'll be like, ooh, ha, ah, oh. I just, you know, All right. Johnny, uh, going forward, I'll just read a bulk of it and you pitch in when you can. How about that? All right. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> okay. I'm just used to being a third wheel. <laughs> Hey guys, sto- story of my fucking life. I'm just being drug along for the ride. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, we got a solution to this problem, Johnny. We're going to take all of your lines out. We're going to take your complete roll out. You just sit there to the side, <laughs> make funny faces, say something if you can. Well, Johnny, I, okay. Read what you can, when you can. How about that? But I always said I was the eye candy of murderous states of mind anyways. <laughs> okay. So Jane Gum was born October 25th in California. So his name was actually supposed to be James, but uh, nobody cared enough to change it. Uh, Gum's mother was a failed actress turned alcoholic prostitute. Since this usually doesn't create a stable home she life, probably did James was comedy placed... along the way somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, he, he was placed in a foster home at the age of two. So from here, he bounced from foster home uh, to foster home until the age of 10 when his grandparents <laughs> rescued him <laughs> rescued him from the foster care system. And from like the book, a lot of this is coming from the book because they omitted a lot for the movie. Oh, yeah. But it wasn't good foster homes. So he lived in Sacramento for two years until at the age of 12, he married. Uh, he murdered his grandparents uh, because he quote wanted to see what it was like. Uh, wanted I to mean, see what it really. What? Like... Okay, wanted don't to see, what, want to it see felt... what it's like. Yeah, I mean, I I don't think any of us want to admit it publicly. I'll tell you, I'll tell you something right now. Grandparents I'm just saying. I just want to say. I just want to say, Grandma, you're lucky the Lord took you before I got the fucking chance. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Shout out to Ted Levine, the guy who played uh, Buffalo Bill. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. He did great in that role. Um, <laughs> oh, monk. <laughs> wanted to see what it felt like is what Edmund Kemper said when he murdered his grandparents back in 1964 at the age of 15. Ed shot his grandmother in the back of the head and then shot his grandfather as he walked up the driveway. He says he killed his grandfather, so, quote, his grandfather didn't have to see his wife like that. Mm. Now, Ed Kemper is Ed a Kemper's very familiar a good man name. at heart. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now for those that's who, because he's actually he's actually narrated hundreds of audiobooks. Yes, oh, that's yeah. that's one of them. But also because uh, his character, well, there's an actor that plays him. He's not actually in Mine Hunters, which yeah, be awesome. He's like, I'm gonna win an I'm gonna win an Emmy for this show. <laughs> <laughs> what was your greatest achievement? I don't know if it's brought up. between working for David Lynch, and, uh, fin- David Fincher. And killing my grandmother. It's one of those two. I just don't know which one yet. <laughs> I, I don't know if it was brought up about Ed uh, either. Just so the audience gets a little bit of a visual. He was a monster of a man. He was like 6'9", 300 pounds. Oh, yeah. Just a giant. Uh, giant but uh, bumbling fuck is the way. When he it. was arrested, they put him at 281 pounds. Oh, my God. Hold on. He, is this a picture? No, holy crap. Okay. Yeah. I think I got a picture of him. Hold on a second. Big. I, I really want to show everybody this picture so they know who we're talking about. Big old yeah. guy. Machine. Dude, this guy's a shit brick house, man. Like, I know the show, he's like always sitting down, but like. Think of really someone. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hold on. Here's his. Here's him. Think of someone the little... Undertaker's size. Yeah. Yeah. Like, here's him right here. Like, this is him. Yeah. And oh. when he was arrested, uh, he was actually arrested in Pueblo, Cal- uh, Colorado, and they sent the rookie officer to pick him up because they knew his size. You know, <laughs> dude, can you imagine just shitting your pants, like knowing that that's your first assignment? Like, yeah, you're gonna go pick him up. <laughs> it's Say like- what you will of Ed, but that mustache was a real panty dropper. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's the, the, you know what the worst part is like he looks like he would help you out no matter what. Like he looks like if you need to move, he's gonna bring the truck. Well, you know a I mean? lot of a lot of the FBI agents that like interviewed yeah. him and stuff, <laughs> they said they became really good friends with him, and the, like <laughs> like they said yeah. he was very personable. Like he hung out at a place called the jury room and talked to all the cops while his murders were going on. They'd be like, oh, yeah, Ed, we found a gruesome one today. This is what we know about it. <laughs> and even when he when he killed his mom, he uh, he called the police department. And they're just like, oh, Big Ed's just joshing us. Like, he, did, he yeah. didn't kill these people. Yeah, he was one of those guys that he wanted to get caught. He wanted people to know. Yeah. It's kind of, yeah. Oh, no. He already had, he had that same. Comparing him to like, The Undertaker. He legitimately gave his mother a tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I relate to the fact that just like comedians, we want people just to show up to our show, but we have to really try call people like, hey, can you come to my show? This guy, he just wanted somebody to show up to his crime scene and nobody would. I feel bad for him. He's like an open micer. <laughs> <laughs> so his early life, uh, his mom, yeah. Carnell. <laughs> Uh, his mom, Clarnell, was uh, a pretty, according to Ed, there has been reports out there that kind of contradicts what he says. But according to Ed, she hated men and therefore hated Ed. And she treated him, uh, you know, like shit, controlled him, called him a little monster. I mean, he was. She locked him in the basement so he wouldn't rape his sisters. Oh, shit. Uh, so Ed responded, um... That's he such, said his pa, pa, pause it real quick, Dan. Yeah, because that's such a horrible thought. That let oh. me let me lock my son in the basement in order to keep him from raping his sisters. Oh Jesus, man, these killers! And uh, like, so how he responded was uh, his. He said his mom loved her cat more than him, so he uh he buried the cat alive, and when the cat was dead, he dug it up, cut off its head, and put it on a stick. Oh Jesus Christ! Yeah, that's a perfectly Popsicles. normal reaction. <laughs> uh, it, it's still now. Here's in Taiwan. Question. That's just a kebab. <laughs> <laughs> now Tom brings up a good question here, and I thought I think uh, what do you, what is your opinion? Why do serial killers always seem to have a room uh, with a broken '80s TV stereo that randomly blasts death metal? Well, like, we're going to talk about this with uh, Gary Hynek, one of the killers coming up. All right, but, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll put that question to well, like, time. Well, like, it's just um, a lot of guys, like David Berkowitz, his room literally had half-empty milk bottles and a mattress, and that was, like, it. And his, like, incoherent scribbling on the wall. It's, it's how a lot of these guys respond to psychopathy. You know, they need noise to kind of drown out Women the voices in their head. We must pay. The, the women will die. <laughs> yeah. Are you doing an impression of John Belushi from that restaurant scene in Blues Brothers? How much for the women? <laughs> like, no, um, no, no, that was... Uh, uh, that's Berkowitz. That was Berkowitz? That's what he sounded like? Oh, yeah. Um, so, actually, check out our David Berkowitz episode. It's three parts. But in part two, uh, Johnny actually reads one of the letters... And uh, the reviews Jeez. have been a Jewish Heath Ledger s Joker. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Okay. He. Yeah. Is, but yeah, but I'll let you guys keep going. Like, because obviously, with each of these serial killers, uh, we could talk about each so, one for hours and hours. But he uh, he was released from prison at the age of twenty one because. Uh, he went into the juvenile system, and at the age of 21, he got released. And everybody at that place said, don't let him live with his mom. So guess who he moves in with? <laughs> um, oh. And his mom worked at California State University, the Santa Ana campus, because uh, okay. this is where uh, Ed Kemper moves to. And uh, because his mom seemed to love these women at the campus more than him, on May 7th, 1972, Kemper began his uh, 11th month murder spree that ends uh, with eight women dead. Jeez. Well, I mean, I, I mean, 11 months, man. I mean, 
I must have, he must have like finishing anxiety at that point. Like he couldn't even make it the whole year. You know what I mean? Like it's so, like, when like you break up with somebody on the eleventh month, and you you don't even have the joy of saying, "Yeah, I dated that bitch for over a year." You know what I mean? Like so <laughs> so uh, he gets the nickname Coed Killer uh, because he would drive around campus because he had a campus uh, parking pass. And he would give rides to these women. And uh, at first it started, he would just uh, drive around, take them to a secluded area, then drive back to their place. Hey, Dan. Uh, yo. Ed Kemper was the first guy to go on a date and literally get ghosted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. So, and then, like, he would uh, strangle them, uh, shoot them, stab them. The first two victims he stabbed, and he would remark how, like, uh, all he saw in the movies was if he stabbed somebody, they die immediately. Uh, he's like, hey, uh, they just kind of leaked to death. It's like, no shit, Ed. What is <laughs> yeah. I, love, I, I love how he's just going to complain about movies and like, you know what? You guys, you guys got to be more honest. <laughs> I mean, but uh, one, oh. one weird thing about Ed, and I don't know if this is in the script. But he wouldn't stab them through their breasts. Oh, yeah. He was so, like, modest and afraid of women. Uh, his first victim, he accidentally grazed her breast after she was dead. And he raped her. Um, he's he's like, oh, geez, sorry. And that's, the, that's the interesting and fascinating thing with serial killers is they, while they could do the most depraved things ever, they all seem to have a line that they do not want to cross. You know, right. I mean, there's a certain line. In this case, it seemed like anything that they, in their head, again, his head, not saying this in general, anything he found to be feminine, you know, he would be like, oh, no, no, no. And yeah. It, it this, this case, he had issue with women. So I think any, you know, so it, it's really interesting to see these uh, killers somehow have rules. His, uh, his, because of his mom, he was afraid of women. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, um, there was actually a point where everybody was talking about the co-ed killer. And he said uh, if the women he picked up started talking to him about the co-ed killer, he'd let them live. <laughs> okay. That's kind of like, that. this guy Ooh. is seriously the mind of a comedian. He's like, if she comes up oh. to the show and says, my set was great. She lives. <laughs> like, like, it's well, like, like very crazy. It's like, hey, you want a you want a game? You didn't even know you were playing today, lady. <laughs> so, oh my God, That's... he would uh he would cut off the heads of his victim and Jeez. then uh have sex with them. And the one question people always wonder is what hole? And uh, usually he'd fuck the throats. <laughs> and here's the other right like, up that old Asafa guy. If you've never had esophagus, <laughs> raw esophagus on your penis, then you're not fucking living. <laughs> you would think. You would think. Would it be easier to to find women that uh you know have that little smokers thing? <laughs> you know, oh. a human glory hole for him at that point. <laughs> um, we're all going to hell, by the way. Hey, oh, baby, uh, uh, <laughs> gotta get some of this throat tonight. So he actually. He would keep some of the bodies in his room with him. He would relieve his. You want to stick it in fantasies. my air hole? <laughs> <laughs> Call it plugging me up. <laughs> and um, <laughs> he actually buried two of the heads in the garden with the heads with the eyes faced up towards his mom room, mom's room because she quote always liked it uh, when people looked up to her. Ah, well, that's a nice Mother's Day gift. I was, like, I was very thoughtful. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> very thoughtful. on uh, April 20th, 1973, after coming home from a party, 50 year old, 52 year old Clarnell uh, awakened her son with her arrival while sitting in her bed reading a book. She noticed Kemper enter her room and said to him, I suppose you're going to want to sit up all night and talk now. Kemper replied with, ah, It's still too bad. No, good night, he said. Then he waited for her to fall asleep. Then he snuck back into her room to bludgeon her with a claw hammer and slit her throat. So he decapitated her, uh, had sex with her. If you use a her. hammer, 
to buddy. I recommend all hammer. Ball <laughs> pin is too nasty. Uh, you know, sledgehammer, that's a lot of mess. You're going to want a claw hammer. Get in there, gut in the, the, the heart of the, of the brain, if you will, and just boom, take those neurons and disconnect them. So why did you get fired from Home Depot again? <laughs> like, like, like Johnny, you have to leave. You can't work here anymore. Why? You can't keep comparing the tools to murder weapons. Yeah, you can. Uh, you know, oh. that's fascinating because I actually had a conversation with somebody one once before and they were like, uh, what's it like? What's it feel like when you're in love? I was like, have you ever done a home invasion? And I tried to explain the same <laughs> feeling. They didn't get it. Why do you have this as a frame of reference? I've, I've, I've had a rough life. <laughs> All right. Well, if anybody can take anything away from the show, it's just, you know, don't fuck with Johnny ever, like ever at all. <laughs> That's the general consensus of the comedy scene around Johnny. Yep. Yep. Next up. To- <laughs> I'm nothing but a fucking sweetheart. God damn it. <laughs> oh, man. Just- oh man so after ed had sex with his mother's head uh he used it as a dartboard what? uh and then he uh quote put her head on the shelf and screamed at it for an hour uh and ultimately he smashed her face in yeah <laughs> also he also cut out her tongue and larynx and put them in the garbage disposal. However, the disposal spit the vocal cords back at him, and he said that seemed appropriate as much as she bitched and screamed and yelled at me over so many years. And yeah. then the next day, he called his mom. He's just in his living room screaming at that head, screaming, guess who's not going to dust on Sundays anymore, bitch? <laughs> uh, next from a friend uh i'm gonna read and excuse my language i never i never really cursed this badly but it's it's so damn funny what he, he wrote he really he wrote after hearing what he did to his mother and what his mother put him through he's like Ryan and i thought my Ryan mother Riggs. was a cunt <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh the next day he calls over his mom's best friend and he uh he strangles her, and he strangles her with such force, force he lifts her off the ground and snaps her neck with the uh, crook of his elbow. Christ. Uh, so then he calls the police. Like we said, they kind of laugh and blah, blah, blah. So he flees. He drives 12 hours to Colorado and then realizes nobody's talking about him. So he calls the police again, and he says, go check the house. So they do. They call him back at the pay phone, and uh, then... That rookie officer shows up to arrest him. Jesus. Well, at least, at least he wanted to get caught. You know, I mean, there wasn't so much of a chase. You know, so I mean, at least. But man, I'd still be fucking scared because, like, how tall is he again? Uh six nine. Six nine. Six, nine. I'm five nine. That's hey, welcome, that's- Rook. I I know it's your first week on the case, but uh. The old fella came down from the fucking beanstalk. He's done killing women and fucking them in their throat. You got to bring him. <laughs> oh, that's a that's a that's a shit detail. I'll tell you that right now. So, uh, after killing his grandparents, Gum was sentenced to six years and to layer vocational rehabilitation, where he was taught how to be a tailor. Following his release, Gum worked off the books in at least two restaurants and sporadically in the clothing business. While beginning work in Baltimore, uh, at a dog Baltimore so cute, by cu- the way. curio oh, store. <laughs> thank you. She came with the giant pit in my basement. <laughs> oh, precious. <laughs> precious. It puts lotion on the skin. Hey, I used to if be you married to my too. dog. I'll kill you. <laughs> Oh, my God. Uh, So he met and began a romantic relationship with a local flutist, Benjamin Raspail, uh, who financially supported him for some time. Uh, Raspail later ended his Dan, I usually don't correct. I think it's a, I honestly, flautist. Flautist? I, okay. Uh If I fucked that up, then I apologize. 
I love, I love the how the last thing that on. Johnny chimed in on was I'm, talking about. I'm ending our friendship like, over. Well, and then he's like, "By the way, it's a flautist." <laughs> <laughs> Johnny, oh. that's why I love you. <laughs> oh, man. So, after this guy ended the relationship with, uh, with uh, Gum, he uh, started a relationship with a Norwegian sailor named Klaus. So, Gum murdered Klaus and created an apron from his skin. He took Klaus's Ooh. decapitated head and inserted him inserted a moth in his throat, then placed it in a jar, which was stashed within a car in an impound warehouse owned by Ras Pale, and we see that in the movie. Ah! So it was around this time that James started to believe that he was transgendered uh, and wanted to transition into a woman. Now, in the book, um, there's a lot of outdated stuff about transgendered people. Uh, So all I'm going to say... Uh, they offer up the Sorry, profile. Quick question, guys. Quick, co- yo. What is mulp? If I can read, if, if I'm reading that correctly. Mulp. Oh, oh. somebody asked a question. Has uh, yeah, what, anyone what, anyone knows the serial killer perfect, perfected the mulp? I don't know what the mulp is. Uh, uh, what is? A, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm afraid. But I'm gonna look it up real quick. Oh God. A mulp sounds like a dance from the 50s where teenagers don't touch each other. It's an anthropomorphic comic book, a pulp adventure set in a world of mice. I'm going to put murder next to it because I think it's going to have multiple meetings. I don't know. It's anyway. Like, it's like docking, but not yeah. sexual. It's definitely not a graphic novel about mice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know, these murderers in their spare time, they really do uh, know how to perfect a a graphic novel about mice. (laughs) Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, So, So, Jane Gum wanted to become a woman, but the woman he wanted to become was his mother. And this brings Mm. us to our second serial killer. Uh, Everybody really knows him, uh, not because of his murders, but because of his extracurricular hobbies. Ed Gein, Ed Theodore Gein, also known as the Butcher of Plainfield or the Plainfield Ghoul, was an American convicted murderer and body snatcher. Gein's crimes committed around his hometown of Plainfield, Wisconsin, uh, gathered widespread notoriety in 1957 after authorities discovered he had exhumed corpses from local graveyards and fashioned trophies and keepsakes from their bones and skins. Uh, Gein also confessed to killing two women, Tavern owner Mary Hogan in 1954 and hardware store owner Bernice Warden in 1957. So, Gina had a very controlling mother who doted on him all the time, who told him that women women were the scourge of the earth. They only okay, wanted real one quick thing. interjection, guys. Yeah, I got an Urban Dictionary definition of mulp, meaning. I got Mainly unidentified liquid protein, aka crotch rot. Ooh, my my! I got another one. I don't that know says how we're using to, that appropriate to pulverize somebody down into a juice. Oh, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. Well, that says terrible. to mean to beat or mash a thing or do a bloody messy. P- it would look like tomato squash. I'm a mulp you up. That boy got mulped. You're going to the right way of a mulpin. I love how... Okay, so I'm just going to ask before you guys even interject, what fucking idiot is walking around saying I'm going to mulp you, you fucking <laughs> weirdos? <laughs> what parent says you're, you're, you're going, you're leading to a mulpin? <laughs> All right. You're on well, your way to a mulpin, boy. <laughs> all right. Well, anyways, continue on. Uh, so we all know Ed Gein because of the skin clothes. You can Google Ed Gein skin and find everything that they found in his house. Um, Ed Gein is also the first serial killer to get a insanity plea. Um, because I did not a lot know of, that. Yeah, because he was very... Uh, his mental capacity was like that of a five-year-old. A lot of the people that interviewed him said it was like talking to a child. Huh. So, like, they, they proved he in court that he... And he was damaged. 
Yeah. Um, he was legitimately uh, not fit for trial, and he lived the rest of his life in a facility. Like it's not like he was unfit and then got set free. He ended up living and dying yeah. in a mental facility. Jeez. Uh, even like some of the interviews that you can find out there, it's like a child is speaking. Uh, so he, you know, he fastened a nipple belt, chairs, oh. uh, aprons. He had a whole suit that he would wear and pretend you know, be a woman, be his mother. Um, there lampshades. Lampshades. Um, and Martha Stewart, if you will. Uh, yeah, Martha Stewart in the skin genre. Jesus. But a lot of people Skin is actually that. the biggest organ on the body, guys, and we're going to use every part of it. That earrings you made out of vaginas, <laughs> it's a good thing. <laughs> oh, man. Um, and, uh, so like a lot of people say he was a cannibal, but he wasn't, uh, there's enough evidence to suggest. Plus he says he never ate anybody. Um, so this, this part is, you know, Buffalo Bill's skin suit. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting. But again, he, they, he was also the inspiration for another fictitious serial killer. Uh, I want to see if anybody can, who knows who it is. Norman Bates. Very good. Very is it good. Psycho? Yes. yes. Mm. I always, I always, I watched the original, but then I got bored one day and I wanted to watch the one Vince Vaughn's Norman Bates, which I just wanted him to be like, listen, guys, I don't know. Maybe I'm, am I going to kill her? Maybe I'm not going to kill her. Maybe I'm just going to watch from a distance. I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I wanted him to get into that, that Vince Vaughn tripping and when he's thinking about killing her, I'm like, please just do that. <laughs> just Vince Vaughn it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyways, let's go. Have you go back here? Go back on. Uh, so Gum began applications for gender reassignment surgery and applied to schools such as John Hopkins. However, uh, his applications were declined because, uh, you know, he was too physically, dis uh, psychologically disturbed. Uh, he was very violent. And when his, his application was rejected, he violently assaulted the doctor. Um, he was introduced. Hey, John in Jacobs, 19... what's up with the reasonable ass comments? <laughs> Wait, what? I said, what's up with the reasonable ass comments? Everyone's talking about wild shit. He's like, oh, I didn't mind the remake. Oh, I didn't see that one. <laughs> ah, the remake was all right. <laughs> I loved it. Oh, man. So, uh, in 1975, he is introduced to Dr. Hannibal Le Lecter. Um, <laughs> that, that's a good one. Uh, and shortly after this, he moves to Belvedere, Ohio. Oh, H. Um, oh, you know, H. Towns in Ohio always sound better than they actually are. Yeah, I, I know. So sometime in 1982. You know, Belvedere, Ohio sounds like a nice place. You get there and there's like a Wendy's, a fucking pilot, and a shitty by the hour motel. <laughs> I'm going I'm going to a I'm going to a city called Bidwell. <laughs> I don't think there's gonna be a lot of mansions. I'm kidding. <laughs> I can't wait to see all your knock them dead. <laughs> knock them dead. <laughs> so in 1982, he met a woman named Frederica Bimmel. Uh, she was an overweight woman, and her skin uh, struck his attention. Gum then conceived this idea that if he could not become a female by legal means, he could make himself into a woman through fastening together a woman's suit made from the skins of real women. So then he set up to take over a property the in the logical town. step. Yeah, I obviously. thought about carving up a muscular man so I could have the suit of a muscular man. <laughs> so he uh, he gets into this house uh, that was owned uh, by Bimmel's employer, um, Mrs. Littman, uh, and she dies and he takes over her house and she has a large well in the basement. So shortly after he acquires this house, um, Frederica Bimmel becomes the first victim of Buffalo Bill. Uh, so basically... In the books, he sets a noose up at the top of the stairs, puts her head in it, and then pushes her off the stairs. Jeez. 
But she is the third body to be found because he weighs her down. And this is actually what led uh, FBI agent trainee Clary Sterling uh, to him. Uh, because she kind of figured she, Bimble was the only body that was weighed down. So that means that Buffalo Bill's trying to keep people off of his trail. So chances are he lives in Belvedere, Ohio. No, oh, okay. Um. So this whole idea on of trapping women in a pit unfortunately comes from a very real life monster, uh, Gary Heidnick. Uh, Heidnick. Me and Johnny actually episode number three we cover Gary Heidnick because he's a Pennsylvania serial killer. Uh, all of his crimes are committed in uh, Philadelphia. So. Ooh. He was an abused child, like he was a bedwetter, and his father would do things like hang the uh, the piss stained sheets in the window so can, everybody can see. He'd Jeez. make his he'd make his son go to class wearing these stained clothes. Um, one time he fell over in a yeah, supermarket. Man. You want to dirty that shit up? You're gonna wear it like that. God damn it! You think we're made of money? You think we're the fucking Rockefellers? <laughs> I hope I can see Johnny play every serial killer's father in a movie one day. Just like <laughs> you would kill that role, man. I love it. Well, that's my dream role. You're the Rockefellers. <laughs> I just never heard anybody reference that in so long. I love it. Oh my god. So <laughs> he is an awkward child. Uh he had a head injury. He fell out of a treehouse. And if you look at his fucking head. It looked like he was removed from the womb with a plunger. Jeez. All right. Let's, we got to see what this guy looks like. Hold on. Let's keep talking. I'm just going to pull. Yeah. It. And uh, so he begins this, like nobody talked to him. Nobody liked him. So he begin, uh, gets this kind of God complex in his head where like he decided that nobody was talking to him because they weren't worthy of his presence. Like he felt like he was superior to everybody. And this kind of led him to, uh, he founded the United Church of the Ministers of God. Uh, one of his original nicknames after his cop was Brother Bishop because he deemed himself the bishop of his church and all money had to go through him. So I think at the end he had accumulated like $600,000. Um, and then he kind of, he wants, he wants a group of people subordinate to him so he comes up with this idea of a baby factory in his basement. Um, so he, over the course of six months, he trapped six women in his basement. He dug a pit. He would put three of them in there at a time. He would chain the other women up. He would just ungodly torture. He tried to stick a screwdriver in their ears to make the women deaf. Uh, he fed them uh, wet dog food and white bread. Um it was just horrible, horrible, horrible shit. Yeah. Uh, real, real quick, I want to just give a shout out to Judge Reinhold in the background here. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's before his big break in, <laughs> in Beverly Hill Cop. Holy <laughs> that's Judge Reinhold, I swear to God. <laughs> so what did you do before being the like cop to Tim Allen and Santa Claus? Well, I was standing behind the old Gary Heidnick. Yeah. <laughs> but like, yeah, that head, that was the size when he was a toddler. Jeez. Yeah. Big ass very, head. Very, very weird looking motherfucker. Well, um, in another lifetime, he could have went on to become Peyton Manning. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, we got to jump to the comment section. L'Oreal skin care got shit on Buffalo Bill. <laughs> All right, should have went into a restaurant business again. You skin them, we eat them. Jesus Christ. Landlord shooting the tenant in the face for rent seems reasonable or not. Jeez. All right, we got a bunch of serial killers in this uh, comment section. I like it. But anyways, so, continue. I busted by a book for that comment. That's hilarious, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we get to the first death, Sandra Lindsay. Um, she was very dis defiant over the course of three years of captivity. She fought 
Gary Heidnick every step of the way. And uh, he just basically beat her to death until she yeah. lost the will to live. And um, so instead of getting rid of her body, he uh, cooks her and feeds her to the other captives. Oh, my God. And there actually, there is a moment he's I boiling mean, her. No, we're giving him shit for this. Peep for this for, for no reason because he's using every part of the body. He's outsourcing. <laughs> it's organic. It's green. It's like an impossible burger almost. Like, give this man some credit. It's an innovator that thinks, what do I got to do? Dispose of this? No, I can use it. <laughs> <laughs> So there's actually one moment where he's boiling the head, and I don't know if you've ever boiled like a deer skull, but it smells fucking disgusting. Why, why neighbor, would we boil a deer skull? Uh, to bleach it, to get the brains out oh, of it. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. The mounted pot. Ah, yeah. Yeah. So okay, that's that seems very reasonable, um, Jesse. That seems very reasonable from Dan, but it's not true. It's the only way to clean the semen out after you fuck it. <laughs> god damn it johnny oh my god uh so <laughs> so a cop shows up because the neighbors complain and uh basically the cop's like hey what's that smell and gary just goes oh pot roast cooked too long i fell asleep watching the eagles game <laughs> and the cops the cops just like yeah okay that checks out <laughs> jesus christ so I then, just, go ahead. He looks like a drunken leprechaun. <laughs> so then, real quick, shout out to Tom. He got busted by Facebook for the just the tip comment. Oh wow! Oh my god! Right, Tom. Shout out to Tom for a drunkard because it's not 1895. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then we get to the death of Deborah Dudley. She was electrocuted to death. Um, because Gary Heidnick put the girls in the pit and then, uh, chained them together and put water on them and the cord touched, uh, Deborah's bare skin and killed her. Jesus. Uh, so then, uh, Josephine, Fina Rivera, she was the first captive. She escaped and she brought police to, uh, Gary Heidnick's house. And then, uh, he got the death penalty and he's Full put disclosure. to get death. Sorry to interrupt Yo. you, Dan. But full disclosure, um, since I, I recently watched The Many Saints of Newark, it uh, prompted me to start watching The Sopranos all over again. And all these deaths, I know they're victims and I feel terrible. But in my mind, I'm just thinking Tony Soprano, like, doing this to him because they didn't pay him. Like, shock this bitch, Silvio. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Deborah Dudley did get buried in the Pine Barrens. There's a connection to The Sopranos. Oh, okay. There it is. Boom. There it Full is. circle. <laughs> so he was put to get death in 1999. And I want to briefly talk about uh, Buffalo Bill would uh, distribute the bodies in rivers. And uh, Gary Ridgway, a.k.a. the Green River Killer, he, he was convicted of 47 murders. But it's believed uh, and probably true that he killed close to 100 prostitutes. But he, you know, uh, Green River Killer, He, uh, his first five bodies he put in the Green River. Um, but the other connection, too, is... You know, to, Ted, to piggyback on that, it's yeah. it's uh, oftentimes uh, prostitutes are the easiest victims. Those oh, are the women 100%. that are uh, the victims of serial killers the most. Because the people on believe... the scourge of society that won't be missed. Uh, we play. We, listen, we play Grand Theft Auto. We get it, all right. Well, like <laughs> Joel Rifkin, Joel Rifkin, in the course of a year, killed seventeen prostitutes, and he killed so many of them so quickly that even the prostitutes on the street didn't know they were dying. Wow, that's crazy. Okay, that's so so uh, at the start of the film, uh, Buffalo Bill has killed uh, five women. Um, so he always targeted larger women. As he needed a suit big enough to fit his bigger male body, he kept them entrapped in the large dry well for 72 hours, starving them to loosen up their skin, making them clean their skin with lotion uh, before killing them a few days later. 
Uh, he hanged the first two women, luring them to the top of the stairs with the promise of a shower and pushing them off. Uh, he subsequent shot his victims with his Colt Python handgun. Uh, and what this basically says is that Buffalo Bill, the killing is not part of the process. He wants it over. He doesn't want to do anything with it. He's a process killer, meaning uh, the only thing he cares about is getting the skin from these women. Huh. So, never, Oh, man, I am a product killer all day. <laughs> Uh, so during his series of killings, Gum received the nickname Buffalo Bill as officers at Kansas, Kansas City Homicide made a tasteless joke that this one likes to skin his humps. Hmm. Uh, so he would basically, Buffalo Bill would fake an injury to, you know, as we see in the movie, would fake an injury to learn uh, lure a woman to the car. And this is the M.O., of one of the most notorious or well-known serial killers that the United States has ever seen. Over the course of four years, from 1974 to 1978, Theodore Bundy murdered 30-plus women across uh, multiple states. Uh, Idaho, Washington, Oregon. Theodore uh, Bundy makes him sound too sophisticated. Ted. <laughs> Teddy. <laughs> It sounds like he's gonna give his kid uh, the talk on like a, like one of those feel good Friday sitcoms. <laughs> they got ABC for their TGI Friday lineups, where Theodore Bundy gives a talk. Well, son, <laughs> you gotta fake like you're on the side yeah. of the road, damsel in distress, and that's when you get him. <laughs> oh, good boy. So Bundy would fake some sort of injury, like either putting his arm in a sling or like. Um, he killed two women around the Lake Shamish, uh, basically like, hey, I need help putting my sailboat on the roof of my car. Uh, just whatever to lure the women out of public eye into his own little world of control, which was his Volkswagen be Beetle. From there, he would strangle them uh, and then perform necrophilia. To, get to lure which, a woman these days, all Ted Bundy would have to say, excuse me, miss, uh, over here there's chicken nuggets and manipulation. <laughs> <laughs> or hey if you come over here i'll subscribe to your only fans jesus christ jesse you stole my line <laughs> <laughs> Bingo. oh we're both hacks <laughs> yep we are so ted bundy is easily <laughs> the most recognizable american serial killer why like um it's mostly because all across tv and movies uh, the serial killer is always displayed as this crazy dude that you take one look at him, you're like, yep, that guy kills people. But what fascinated the American public is, look at Bundy. He was a young Republican. He wanted to be a lawyer. He wanted to be a future president of the United States. He was, he was vibrant. Uh, he was great at conversations. Um, just he was a real Johnny him. Smith. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I look at Ted Bundy and go, boy, if he's missing his front teeth, he would look 100% like my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like, I, I don't know. Why do you think he's famous, Jesse? Uh, I, I think that's the exact reason you said. Because he didn't fit the, the idea of a serial killer. And he was probably one of the most invisible serial killers of all time. No one had that moment of, oh, yeah, that's him. Like During his trial, he was charismatic as fuck. If you, you watch uh, Ted Bundy takes on Netflix, they show a lot of his trial, and he's like in a three-piece suit, yeah. sitting with his leg off the table, smiling at everybody like, hey, good look, and what's up? How could he How could he do it? That was, that was his defense, essentially. He's such a well-put-together person. He's such a wholesome guy. How could he do it? You know, and and, it, and that's what he was definitely working the reasonable doubt, uh, right? Very by doing that, you know what I mean? Because and and also, I mean, besides the fact that there's always like maybe another two movies every two years, yeah. You know I mean, there's always he's he's in my opinion, he's probably one of the most portrayed serial killers in film, in my opinion. Yeah, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. I just just for me, like. I, I can't swing a dead cat without seeing a Ted Bundy movie, documentary, tape, or whatnot. 
And uh, I think Ted he Bundy. brings a real life horror novel to life. Oh with, yeah, uh, Doctor Javkel and Mister Hyde, because you, oh, know, you see much. this well put together man, and then the monster on the other side. I think what was so brilliant about the movie you're talking about that was on Netflix is uh, Zach Efron played mm-hmm. is in that movie. If I remember correctly, you never see I just Ted Bundy do anything evil. You never see him do anything evil. You never see any crazy. You just see a sweet, charming dude the whole movie. And it's at the very end where we finally get that little, like, they ask, what did you, what, did you do it? And he does something to reveal it. And it just goes, holy shit. And I think it's a fascinating thing. It's like, we know he's guilty, but the whole movie played, like, maybe he is innocent. And I think that's what made that movie so good. Because we knew it was guilty. We knew the inevitable ending was guilt. We just didn't know how we were going to get to guilt. The first time he was arrested in Colorado, they had almost no evidence. Yeah. But he escaped from the jail twice. And even his friends were like, dude, don't run. They got nothing on you. Like, So he runs and goes to, <laughs> goes to Florida. And that's where he, he leaves bite marks on the victims. Oh, uh, Bundy didn't realize that you could take an imprint and match the dental to his. Um, mm-hmm. So all of a sudden you have this good looking. Good, good luck, motherfuckers. <laughs> good looking American man. Uh, and then all of a sudden they're like, yeah, necrophilia. He did this to sorority women. Jeez. And then I think that's just it. It and imploded. And he maintained his innocence the entire time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Kind of like your typical Republican just blaming the media for painting a bad portrait. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, I'm not going to ostracize half the fucking country, but I will say he played a game to the end where he kept trying to okay. like, uh, put off his execution like date. Republican, Republican Senator Matt Getz, who says that uh, the liberal media is making up the fact that he slept with underage women. There. How about that? I'll, how about this? I'll hey, hey grown up stable fan base. Dan Brady hates half of you. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna stable it all off. Whether you're left or right, you're the you're the same cheeks on the same asshole. See, Johnny, Johnny is playing this. This is what he does every episode. He tries to I make, know, I know. make no oh he, wow. He yeah, because I goaded him somehow to call out all Republicans. on the right side. Because I goaded that he, he or he just shits volunteered right all that information. Dan's all like, here, right, let me right. shit on a whole group of people, unwarranted. So, but Ted Bundy. So let's uh, yes. let's get us back to that. So uh, he was executed in 1989, but shortly before he was executed, he just went, I did it. Interview me, talk to me. And that's where we get a lot of our interviews and stuff from. And, uh, and this time, another connection to Gary Ridgway and the book, uh, and, you know, Silence of the Lambs is that Ted Bundy actually communicated with the FBI in Washington saying, hey, uh, you should do this. Look for this. This guy does this. And he actually uh, pred- predicted correctly that Gary Ridgway had a graveyard of bodies that he revisited a lot. Jeez. So a uh, sixth woman was found with her scalp and two diamond shaped pieces of skin. This is at the beginning of of Silence of the Lambs, and shortly after that, Gum abducted Senator Ruth Martin's daughter, Catherine. He had posed as a man with a broken arm who needed help moving a sofa into the back of the van. And, of course, Catherine uh, came in the system, uh, and, you know, as we see in the movie, he renders her unconscious, removes her dress, which was his M.O., threw it out of the van, and then trapped her in the basement. It was shortly after this that Jack Crawford, the head of the Behavioral Analysis Unit at the FBI instructed FBI agent Curly, God damn it, Sterling, to try and consult with serial killer Hannibal Lecter on the case. Uh, with Lecter's help and her own resolve, Agent Sterling was able to pinpoint Buffalo Bill to Belvedere, Ohio. And then we come to probably, to me, one of the most iconic uh, moments in movie history when Jack Crawford shows up to the house in, what, Detroit, Michigan, and Sterling shows up to the house in Ohio, and they're both knocking at the same time. And then you're like, oh, no, Agent Sterling's in trouble. Yep. Then, of course, we have the shootout in the basement, uh, which 
which ends up in Buffalo uh, Bills' death. It was that was a richly intense scene, and they 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 oh. did such a good job like carrying it. Like I love that. I think one of my favorite parts of that scene is where Buffalo Bill can see her, and yeah. you just see her stumbling in the dark, and it, it's just so intense. Like you're like, oh my god, like. She, he, 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 you will say that moment you're screaming at her. She, he's in front of you. He's in front of you. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. It's like, oh, such a good scene. So, you know, this is Buffalo Bill. This is the information I gathered it from Wikipedia, uh, the Silence of Lands Wikipedia page, some of the book. Uh, but basically, this is Buffalo Bill, and this is all the serial killers that influenced him. Um, but. Silence of the Lamb actually had a huge impact on uh, catching serial killers and the behavioral analysis unit at the FBI. Uh, it actually drew uh, attention to serial killing profile and no longer really thought of as just magic tricks. Um, and then it also, they saw a large increase of female FBI agents wanting to become profiles. And one of these women that were inspired by this movie, uh, Mary O'Toole, actually elicited the confession from Gary Ridgway. Real? Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, because his representation is important. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so basically... Uh, they sent her in there because Gary Ridgway wasn't talking to any men. And they sent her in there and she's like, oh, aren't you such a handsome man? Like buttered him up. And then he's like, yeah, I killed all of these women. Wow. That, yeah, that is, it, it's Jesse, very... in that chair, you look like a NASCAR mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well... Uh, anyways, uh, no, that's that's a fascinating uh, thing about how art, uh, you know, impacts um, the world. Oh and, yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting. So much of the world went into making this movie, and then the movie impacted everybody. So it's a nice little full come circle with that uh, that whole aspect of it. And really, I you opened my mind to I didn't know about a lot of these serial killers. Oh yeah, I knew about two of them for sure. One vaguely, and then uh, Heidnik did not know about, and I didn't realize he was the pit guy. You know oh yeah, mean? yeah. So it was very. I mean, we we discussed this uh, prior to the show because we had to nail down what we we're going to talk about. So yeah, no, this is uh, this has been a very fascinating show. Uh, I want to say I want to thank both of you uh, for stopping by. Before I say any more, do each of you have any closing words on the topic, or how are we? please check out our podcast. Uh, we love doing it. Uh, if you like learning about mostly unknown serial killers with, as you can tell, a little bit of dark humor thrown in, uh, Murder States of Mind, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, uh, also Buzzsprout, Spotify, all major pod chaser platforms. So I, uh, next week episode is Jesse, I just wanted to say... Uh... Go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, next week, we are going to be covering the fast food serial killer, Dennis Paul Dennis Reed, uh, in wow. Nashville, Tennessee. So please check us out. Make sure you do. Uh, uh, Jesse, I just wanted to say thank you so much again for having us on. Yeah. For all the people that wow. commented and watched and listened, thank you guys so much from the bottom of my heart. Sorry about the lag issues, but I hope you guys had a good time. I definitely had a great time. Uh, we uh, definitely, everybody here had a great time. Uh, so uh, real quick, I want to thank Tom. Tom, uh, I want to thank John, my uh, co-host. Uh, Nigel, uh, let's see. No, we had one last. Oh, that was it. Thank you guys so much for joining in. Thank you, everybody who just watched the show. Thank you for everybody who shared it, liked it. This episode will be up tomorrow, so be able, you'll be able to watch it, share it out, like, and subscribe. Make sure you check out these two guys, and make sure you go to their pages as well. Um, go to Daniel Brady for Dan Brady's for his comedian page, and then uh, John, you have a long one. I'm sorry if I butcher it. The a comedy Johnny Smith stylings. Oh, I got a bunch of shit. It's stand up, st stand up comedy Johnny Smith style, and uh, also check out Inquisitive Minds uh, there podcast. You go, right up there. 
I remember I was putting it in. I'm like, oh crap, I'm not gonna remember all this. I'm an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Uh, but anyways, thank. And by the way, uh, make sure you check out my comedy special. Uh, it's up on my website, www.jessepimpanella.com. You'll be able to get the video special there, or you'll have the Amazon link as well as the iTunes link to get the audio. Ten out um, of ten. Do recommend. Thank you, thank you, and because of everybody, we hit number one uh, that that whole weekend, so I was very happy, so thank you guys so much for that. Uh, Anyways, tune in next week for more. Uh, We're going to keep the Halloween show running and going, Uh, and until next time, I'm Jesse, and these two are the murderous states of mind. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Take it easy, everyone.